is by another group that went a little bit later. And so we can't have two webinars. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I think we're going to get started. I think we have enough people here. Um, welcome, everyone, to our budget meeting. Um, I'm just going to start really quickly with um, um, the goals, and partly because we always do it, but partly because you may remember we voted to add one at our last business meeting. So I want everyone to hear that. Um, our goals this year are to move CSD forward with our strategic plan goals, empower students with the academic, personal, and social, social knowledge and skills to build balanced and purposeful lives, ensure equity and access to opportunities for all CAPE students, prioritize the return to full-time in-person learning and support post-pandemic academic and social emotional needs of all students. And, that, and we will reflect a careful examination of line items and consideration of the success and effectiveness of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally sound, uh, fiscally responsible, it will be sound uh, budget. Um, those are our goals. Before we get into the health insurance update, um, we neglected to add public comment. And I just wanna see if there's anyone from the public who wishes to speak, we give three minutes. If there is anyone, please raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Okay. Seeing none. Uh, second item on the agenda, uh, we're gonna do a health insurance update, COVID relief funds, American Rescue Plan update. I'm not sure if that was gonna be Donna or Marcy or combination, but <laughs> please go ahead. Uh, we have a combination. Um, we do have a celebration tonight because we got the ceiling for our health insurance today. Oh, good, okay. okay so we have a 10% 10 um, 10 increase in uh, is what we budgeted for. And the ceiling is a 4.2% increase. Oh, right. Good so news. That, that can drop us 180,000, I believe. Great news. Yep. So that is a good bit of news. Um, that's, that's the good news. <laughs> the, the other news is we're not quite sure what's going on with our COVID relief funds. We were. Um, originally, when we started talking about it, we thought we were going to get close to uh, $2 million, but in conversations um, with people around the state, um, it looks like uh, that, that funding may be distributed um, the way the second, I think it was the second ESSER um, amount was, and it was uh, based on free and reduced um, money. And as everybody knows, we're a pretty low receiver in that. Uh, so that estimate was more like 200,000 instead of 2 million. So, um, so we'll be somewhere between 2 million and 200,000. <laughs> um, I guess the, the message in it all is we can't count on, we can't count on that 2 million um, to find some of the things that we uh, were expecting uh, to use it for. And we'll just have to wait and see the, the uh, states being very tight-lipped about um, applications. And we heard that they are uh, waiting for the feds um, and communicating with the feds um, on some kind of a decision, but everything is just, nobody's heard and it's up in the air. Um, we've been, we've heard not to give up, but uh, you can't count on it. So Marcy, what do you have to add to that? Um, do you want me to segue into more, Donna, about the concept design, or do you want me to wait? No, why don't, why don't you wait on that? Because that's okay. what, yeah. Um, so um, I have nothing more to add. That's basically where we are with the COVID money. Okay. So good news on. <laughs> well, that's good news on the health insurance side. We had, I know we didn't know that mm -hmm. this morning, so that came in. Mm -hmm. um, so that's helpful. Will be helpful for planning. Um, and Marcy is kind of getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but you did include an updated expenditures chart for everyone. I assume that um, will change. It may it hasn't yet, but based after tonight, using this information, maybe some information after we decide on some use of unassigned fund balance, we'll get yeah, an update. That's right, Phil. I updated the, uh, I added a new slide that I'll show you tonight, but, okay. it, but it was kind of late in the day because we got the information so um, I'll, I'll be able to at least update you tonight and um, for where we are right now, at least with the percentage 
Yeah, okay. so I, th I think Marcy, now you can go into your. Yeah. Okay. Is it okay? <clears throat> All right. Yay. Um, Donna and I had been brainstorming on Friday about the concept design and negotiations and what we were planning to do and how to plan the concept <laughs> design. And um, uh, it made me think over the weekend about the possibility of financing the concept design rather than having it come completely out of the expenditure budget and the cash flow. I checked yesterday morning with our bond council and our lead, um, our, our lead guys and for the town that are that help with all of this. And I asked them if that would be a possibility to do a bond anticipated note, a ban. And uh, the long story short out of it is yes. So we have the ability to do a, a, a note financing the $300,000. And um, on top of that, it sounded this morning like the appetite of the town council would be in favor of this. So um, at this point, the situation with this particular type of note is that you only pay interest for the year on this money and the interest rates right now are so low that I asked for uh, a quick a quote on what that interest payment would be for this year from one of the, the bond council guys, and it would only be $3,000 for this year. Essentially, borrowing money with the anticipation of having a bond and with the ability to roll this finance money into the bond if it were to be approved. That's why it's called a bond anticipated note, and you only have to pay interest. And um, John Q from the town finance side said he would also uh, be available for any questions that we have, anything above and beyond what I know that I can answer. So um, that's the situation. But basically, we can take the 300,000. If, if you all decide this, this just gives you options. Again, I just want to make sure I'm making it clear that I'm only giving you data that you can mm -hmm. talk about and decide on. But you could essentially be taking out the $300,000 as the expenditure. And Donna has those numbers of how that impacts the bottom line. Um, it really does drop that percentage increase on the expenditure side as well as, as well as the property tax rate side. That in addition with the decrease in health insurance rate significantly drops it. And Donna has all that data that she's going to be able to talk about as well. So that's the, that's the latest. It gives you more of an option. And um, it would be basically borrowing the money for a year, like I said. Um, and it just, it seemed like, uh, Phil, Heather, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like generally that was an acceptable plan to the, on the town side for their finance side. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of give a little glean. We heard about this this morning at the finance subcommittee meeting that we have once a week, once a month with the town council chair and the budget chair and this and the town manager and our and our side. Um, uh, and they seem to be relatively open to it. It is a, it is, I, I will vouch, it is a typical way of financing these things and it happens frequently in municipalities. The one distinction here is, is it's typically funded over the course of the life of a project. Right, and so this is a little different in the sense that it's a design, which is gonna happen over one year. But the difference here is that tip, if you were to do this all at once, say you had one big bond for a school, mm -hmm. bonding is, uh, can be used, the bond funds proceeds can be used for the design side. And sometimes it's actually done frequently that way, you sort of pay yourself back for those proceeds. In other words, it kind of wraps itself into the overall bond. So, so that's the concept. There is a bit of a risk, right? So, because we're going to go, we're going to go to a bigger bond question to the voters, and it sort of suggests that we would be putting that in, you know, sort of rolling it in. But it is a way to kind of, uh, it's it's a it's a way to kind of uh, fund it in anticipation of a larger note, is the way to put it. And, and the town council would have to sign off on it. But what we, what the message we got this morning is that they're very familiar with that concept. They they use it somewhat frequently. Um, obviously, we're still going to have to make the case um, on 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 how much we need a building uh, or buildings, and so that's you know we already knew we were going to have that conversation with the town council. But um, and it's sort of a financing mechanism, it's somewhat standard. But um, are there any questions from the board on that? I just before Marcy moves on to something else, it's a, I just learned about this option this morning as well. Bill, is um, this bond small enough that it doesn't have to go out to referendum? Right. 
Yeah, it's small enough that the town council can ultimately approve it, right? Yeah, it's still gonna go through the council. Right. Yeah. One million is the threshold. Uh, Bill, if, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Kimberly. Um, if it, um, if the building project doesn't end up passing, um, what what ends up happening, we just pay the interest for mm -hmm. another year on this and see what happens from there. Right. Okay. Yeah. And it Thank depends you. on the structure of the structure of the financing. It could be um, you end up paying it all back at some point or you could push the interest for a year. I think Marcy, mm -hmm. you'll have more detail about that than I No, have, that's but. right. That's right, Phil. Yeah. And it would be the it would lock in with whatever interest rate we have now would be the same interest rate if it's for one year or two or perfect. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about the interest rate change, yeah. really, but I believe, Phil, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it is it is locked in, but I, I could be wrong about that. I believe so, too. Again, it's another deal structure issue, but one of the things, and again, we, this is something for us to consider, and we don't need to decide this tonight, although we'll have to decide it fairly soon, maybe at the next meeting, um, is that uh, it, this came up in our meeting this morning with the town council, is that the, um, the cost of money right now is very, very low. Mm -hmm. So... It's a way to not impact your your cash flow on a particular year with very little downside in terms of the interest rate, particularly at the you know the tax tax free interest rates that we we could get. Um, so anyway, this, so that's something for us to consider, and you know we can get more information as we go forward. But that's a way to essentially roll it forward into the bond, the the larger bond, and not have the impact on the cash flow this year. Any other questions on the board? You can use your raise your hand function too once we start getting more robust in our questioning. Okay, nothing yet. All right, Marcy, you can, if you had another topic, move on to that. I made you a co-host, Marcy, so you can share your screen if you want. Thanks, Donna. Um, I am the intro tonight to the well-anticipated presentation by Jeff Shedd. So I am going to just give us an overall picture before the exciting part comes from Jeff. Jeff, I know you're ready after me. So we are tonight going to focus on staffing and the um, EPS um, and what that represents overall. So I've just put together an overall graph so that you can see where Cape Elizabeth falls for this fiscal year based on what the ED279 reports indicated for each district that we are comparing ourselves to in this little scenario. And this shows the percentage over the EPS percentage for teachers. So basically it's showing what each district in this graph is, is funding over the, um, it's good. over the rate suggested by the, in the state formula. So it sh this particular graph shows Falmouth up here as the leader, but we are, um, oh, did you guys lose the screen? Yep. Yep. Okay, there we go. Um, it shows we're neck and neck with um, Cumberland, North Yarmouth, and then right then below Scarborough, South Portland, Falmouth, or Yarmouth. So here's Cape Elizabeth right up here in the top. So we're, we're kind of, we're, we're doing really well. Um, let's see. So then I wanted to show you if I can get back. There we go. Um, I just wanted to show you what um, this year's budget represents for the amount spent per student. And so I'm showing here, this pie chart represents for Cape Elizabeth, the amount per student is the 19,000. And those are the different categories broken out over here. Obviously the big piece of the pie is the regular instruction, but then it shows you all the other areas, special education, and our in the your your investment, our investment in other instruction, and student and staff support, facilities, maintenance. So these are all the other various categories, all of the budget articles per student, and the EPS calculation shows eleven thousand seven hundred and twenty-eight would be 
what that formula shows. So we just thought it would be nice to show you how uh, Cape Elizabeth is having a great investment in students at 19,000. So um, if there aren't any questions on this, you guys, I am going to do stop share and see if anybody has any questions before Jeff is going to be taking over. Okay, Jeff, I, I yeah, lost I there, he for... <laughs> there he is. Wow, this is so exciting. <laughs> What a lead up. <laughs> uh, Jeff, before you start, I just want to introduce uh, John Springer, who is going to be um, taking your place next year. And so, John, you have to pay close attention to this presentation because it is very special and near and dear to this board. And the same will be expected of you next year. So <laughs> don't worry, I saved it for us because I <laughs> knew that this would be something we need to recreate for Jeff. To say. <laughs> so, so John, can you give a wave so everybody knows who you are? Yes, I, I will only hope to be as impassioned about the EPS model next year as Jeff, I'm sure, will be tonight. And <laughs> we all are historically. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But thanks for coming to the meeting tonight. All right. <clears throat> so I guess I'm going to take it away. I mean, I, I don't think it has quite the same impact. And I want to lower expectations a tiny bit because I don't get to have the flip charts to show with the multicolors and everything else. I was just I, gonna say the colors, the I, I do have them right next to my file cabinet, but it's not really the same impact. Um, I did prepare for the board and I'm assuming the board members received um, a document that sort of summarizes pretty much what I'm gonna be. Okay, I thought, I thought so, okay. Um, I'm not going to be going through that document note by or, uh, note by note, but uh, but I wanted to make sure that at least you got it. Um, so I will say at the beginning that the funding formula means, and well, let me say this: when I refer to the EPS, you can think EPS or you can think uh, ED two seventy nine. Um, the ED two seventy nine document is simply mathematically putting the EPS formula into the calculations uh, that result in a subsidy amount for every school system in the state. Um, and, and my understanding is, and I have no reason to disbelieve this, that the a EPS formula um, is very positively regarded across the country, actually. I think it's gotten a lot of uh, positive publicity, um, largely because it does the best job that one of the best jobs that states can possibly do of making a really difficult decision, which is spreading state subsidy around um, in as equal a way or um, in equitable a way as you possibly can comparing community to community, which is really difficult. So, so nothing I'm going to say is a, criti is a criticism in any way, shape or form of the EPS formula as a, as a mechanism for moving towards equity in terms of school subsidy and school finance. Um, so basically the EPS formula starts by defining um, the staffing um, levels and resources, resource components that go into building what I would call an adequate, pretty good school. Um, and I would say, my understanding is, if I'm, I think I'm right about this, Donna might correct me, when the EPS formula was first created, the state actually looked at and identified certain school systems which were known for running um, very strong, good programs, but at, in a, at, a, at a frugal cost, essentially. And Cape Elizabeth was actually one of those systems that they looked at in forming, in forming the original EPS formula, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, but the goal really is to establish an adequate, pretty good school. Um, because not every community in Maine has the resources that we do. Um, but then it looks at the resources of the community compared to those components of what goes into being an adequate or pretty good school. And it finds out what the need is in each community, what the gap is um, that the state subsidy formula can try to fill. Um, and that's really the whole purpose of ED 279. It's the whole purpose of the EPS formula. Um, so you won't be surprised to know that the punchline of this is that Cape Elizabeth has never been that interested in building a pretty good school system. Um, that's never been the goal and I'm sure it never will be. 
um, people don't consider moving to Cape Elizabeth because they, they hear we have a pretty good school system. Um, they move here, I think, because they've heard quite the opposite, which is that we have an excellent school system at all three, in all three schools. Um, so, and what I believe, and I, I can't help but work in this phrase, because those of you who have heard this before know that this is my standard phrase, and I will repeat it about three times before the end of this presentation, is what I think the Cape Elizabeth community wants and always has wanted for Cape Elizabeth High School and for all the schools in our school system is to operate a small, comprehensive, high-performing high school. That's what I'm going to speak to. Um, pretty good is not really good enough. Um, so the staffing levels at Cape Elizabeth High School, and I'm sure at the other two schools as well, but I'm going to speak to the high school, make it possible for the vast majority of our students to take four years of math, which exceeds the state requirement, four years of science, which exceeds the state requirement, four years of world language, which exceeds the state requirement, there really is no state requirement in world language, and four years of social studies, which exceeds the state requirement. Um, in addition to that, um, our staffing includes social work, uh, support for any students in need, which is not part of the EPS formula, it includes a comprehensive athletic program, which really isn't considered to be an essential program or service. Um, it, we have a specialized specialist college counselor, which is certainly above and beyond what um, EPS contemplates. We have a full-time nurse, which is beyond what EPS contemplates. And we have class sizes of 16.7 students in a class, uh, which, is, which is lower. Although the EPS doesn't specify a particular class size, the ratio that it does look at, which is student to teacher ratio, sort of drives a class size within a certain range. Um, so none of these are essential in building a pretty good school. All of them are beyond the EPS formula. And that's the really critical thing to understand. Um, if they are, however, all those services above and beyond are critical for operating a small, comprehensive, high-performing public high school, uh, which is what I think Cape Elizabeth High School is. So I can get into some specific numbers. Um, the, the biggest difference, and this is what Marcy's prelude was sort of highlighting, the biggest difference between the uh, projected amount based on the EPS formula as reflected in the ED 279 document and the staffing that we actually have in the high school is in the area of regular education teachers. There's a lot of differences, but regular education teachers is the biggest driver of the difference between EPS and what we have. Um, so the EPS formula bases determinations of state subsidy around uh, a student teacher ratio of 16 to one um, at the high school level. Um, and you can find that number in the ED 279 document. I've pointed it out. Um, it's under staff positions, under teachers, and you'll find a little number in parentheses under nine through 12 that says 16 to one. So that is, that's the student teacher ratio that the EPS formula is based on. So our student teacher ratio, in fact, is below 16 to one. Our student teacher ratio this year is 13 and a half to one. So we've got 13 and a half students to 13 and a half students to one regular education teacher. Um, and before going any further with that student teacher ratio issue, I wanted to point out one thing that can be a little um, a, conceptually a little challenging to grasp if you don't live in a school system. Um, and that is the difference between student teacher ratio, that metric of calculating or expressing the staffing in a particular school, and another metric which we're more commonly familiar with, which, which is uh, the average class size in a school, which in Cape Elizabeth High School is 16 to 16.7. So our average class size is 16.7. Um, this is actually um, pretty much the same number um, that I've been able to tell families for the last 20 years when I've been touring them around the school. They always ask, the one question they always ask for 20 years is, what's your average class size? 
And for 20 years, I've been able to say 16.7 plus or minus a couple of tenths. Uh, so there's a tiny variation from year to year, but it's pretty much always centers back on 16.7, which is where it is this year. Um, and that number gets a very favorable reaction from families thinking about bringing, sending their students to Cape Elizabeth High School versus some other places they're considering. And it's not out of line at all. It's quite similar to what other high performing nearby schools have. They're all, I can tell you, we are all right in that area. Uh, we may be a tiny bit off here or there year to year, but we're all right in that area. So the reason there's a difference between the 16.7 average class size um, in Cape Elizabeth High School and the 13.5 to one student teacher ratio is this. Not all of our teachers teach every period. They teach some periods and then they teach most of the periods and then they have some prep periods and then they have a duty period as well. Not all of our students take a class every single period. If every single student in the school took a class every single period and every single period a teacher taught a class, there would be no difference between the average class size and the student teacher ratio. Um, in fact, our average class size in that case would be 13.5, which is what our student teacher ratio is right now. But that's not the case. And because teachers don't teach every period and students don't teach every period, it is virtually always the case that the average class size is higher than the student teacher ratio, which is why we've got that difference between 13 to one student teacher ratio and 16.7 average class size. So, so getting to the bottom line, if Cape Elizabeth High School reduced its staffing to the EPS level of 16, point, 16 to one, 16 students to one regular education teacher, um, I, I'll, this is what would happen. We would have to fire seven teachers. Um, that's a 17% reduction in our school staff. Um, you could think about that as the entire world language department plus two other teachers, or you could think of it as one teacher from every department. Um, but that's essentially what it would mean is reducing our teaching staff by that many teachers. Um, if we were to do that, um, reduce the staffing by 17%, our average class size would go from 16.7 to 19.5 which is a 17% increase, um, it would, that 19.5 number would violate school board policy, um, which provides for a student load per teacher of 75 to 90 students. Um, and it would make us completely uncompetitive and unattractive as a de destination for families who are looking for excellent schools to, to, to bring their students to. Um, to have their students attend. Um, so we'd be losing seven teachers, we'd be increasing class size from 16.7 to 19.5. Um, then what would happen as well is because, because teachers would be teaching more, more total students, they'd be teaching 95 students instead of an average of 85 or so. Um, what would happen is for teachers, the grading and preparation burden of class would increase, which would inevitably mean that the rigor of our classes would decrease because there's only so much time in the day and then evening um, for teachers to do their work. Um, the other thing that would happen is if, if we increase to, this, to the EPS ratio of uh, 16 to one, our student teacher ratio would be greater than 78% of other, all main high schools. Um, it is the exception rather than the norm for teachers to be even in the neighborhood of the EPS um, formula for, uh, for student teacher staffing. Um, and our staff level, which is already higher than most comparison schools, most high performing low poverty schools, which is what Cape Elizabeth is, 
we fall into that category of high performing, low poverty. We are already just based on we are where we are right now, based on a study that USM did in the last year or two, we are already above average in our student teacher ratio. Um, if we were to go to the EPS level of 16, we would instantly jump to the absolute highest uh, student teacher ratio for high performing, low poverty schools, which I don't think is a place that anybody wants to be, or even frankly, to move in any significant degree in that direction. Um, so I have provided the board information um, in the past and I've, I've repeated it in the document that I, gave, I sent to you last week uh, with information comparing student teacher ratios from nearby schools. A couple of years ago, we were virtually identical in terms of other schools. I do see from Marcy's uh, report that um, one of those schools is, seems now to be a little bit higher than ours. I haven't looked into that in detail again. I am curious about it, um, but I, I, I'm not sure what that's all about. Um, but I can tell you we are generally right in the neighborhood of where comparison schools are. I've also provided to the board, you can go into the US News best high schools list for states across America. And I, I put into the document that I prepared for the board a table that shows a total of 12 schools, including Cape Elizabeth. And basically what I did is picked, picked the highest performing schools or among the highest performing schools in each of the surrounding states, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Maine. Um, it was a little more, more schools from New Hampshire and Maine, and, but I wanted to include Massachusetts as well. So you could see because the US New, one piece of data that US News does provide in its best high schools list is student teacher ratio. Um, and it's at least a basis for comparison. I indicated in the document I prevented, presented to the board that I, I think US News has changed its student teacher ratio calculations recently, um, but they don't publicize that. So I can't find it because those numbers have dropped for all of the schools that I looked at from two years ago when I last shared this information from the board until now. But I think it's still a fair apples to apples comparison to look at what, the, what US News is reporting. Um, and again, I would say, if you look at the table with those 12 schools, we are right there with the other schools. Um, there is essentially no difference. Um, there are two schools uh, from Massachusetts and I wanted to include them because I wanted you to know that I wasn't cherry picking schools. I wasn't giving you only the schools that uh, we, look, we look good connect in connection with. But I, I put in a couple of schools in Massachusetts, um, which are well known, um, Lexington High School and Hopkinton High School that are among the, the very few handful of best schools according to US News in Massachusetts. And they, they have um, higher than we do, noticeably higher. Um, US News reports us as 11 to one. I think that includes special education teachers were really 13 to 0.5, but they report 11 to one. They report um, Hopkinton is 13, I think, 13 to one, and Lexington, Massachusetts is 14 to one. Um, what's important to know about Hopkinton and Lexington is they are both schools that are two to three times larger than we are. Their student populations are between 1,000. Uh, Hopkinton is around 1,100 uh, to 1,200, somewhere in there. And Lexington, I'm pretty sure, is between 14 and 1,500. Um, it becomes easier just to have by virtue of economies of scale when you're talking about a much larger school uh, to hit to have less variability in class size because you're spreading the students over many more sections. Um, in Cape Elizabeth High School, it's not uncommon to have just two sections of a particular class. And so the choices you have to make um, are more dramatically skewed. I can answer any questions about that if you want. I don't want to bore you too much, but I did want to point out about Hopkinton and Lexington and why those numbers are higher than us, I believe. Um, so I will come back to this point. Um, the EPS formula was never intended um, to build anything other in Maine and to finance pretty good schools. Um, it's an outstanding funding formula that accomplishes and moves Maine towards equity in terms of funding. 
Um, it is a terrible recipe for building a small, comprehensive, high-performing public school, which I think is what this community has always wanted for all of its schools. And I don't know if that lived up to your expectations, but I am done. So. I'm so glad I saved that report for John, for us. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, thank you, Jeff. That was, that was very helpful as usual. Um, any questions about this presentation? No, I think you've silenced us. Um, oh, Troy has more. <laughs> good, okay. Troy, can you follow that? <laughs> Successfully or just fall? <laughs> um, I tried to pick Jeff's brain on the way home in the car um, to make sure that I was on the right track and I felt really good about it until I just heard Jeff repeat it all. Um, so I will kind of just, I'll feed off that really quickly. I'm not exactly sure. I, I the last meeting I had no power, um, so I missed what my the request was officially. So I I've, I kind of got a bunch of things, um, but largely when you get looking at the EDU 279, it, it becomes really clear a couple of things. And one is that um, the model is a difficult one to apply to Cape because it really is broken down pre KK. One five and then six eight, so we clearly are a five eight. Um, so it's it's kind of a challenge right off the bat to figure out where they are um, assigning which teachers to, um, and then largely like Jeff had said, essentially the the EPS model is really viewed as a minimum and a baseline. That if you walk into any school, in my opinion, you should look at the column on the left of the ED. Uh, U 279 and you should see teachers, admin, a librarian, a health teacher, um, you know, clerical, all of those things on the left. And I, and I view that as that's, and obviously special education is on its own page, gifted and talented has its own funding source. Uh, but so that largely is how I view it. That is the baseline for um, the EPS model of what, what an effective school can be. Um, nowhere in it is it, talk about things like world language, interventionists, um, things like that. So for example, when we look at it, and Jason and I spent some time going over this today, and I think Jeff just said it really well, so I'm not going to repeat it all. Essentially, the real three metrics are um, teacher load, which the board is very aware of, uh, student teacher rate, uh, the student teacher ratio, and then class size. And I think Jeff explained it really well, the difference. And when we add in all of the world language department, for example, I have five world language teachers, a little bit shared with Pong Cove in, an, in a typical year. That immediately skews the uh, student teacher ratio without really impacting the class size. So, um, and some of it was really difficult and challenging to find out what are they calling a regular education teacher? Is an interventionist that teaches a section uh, so it's a regular education certification. They're teaching five students at a time for four blocks or five blocks in a day. That teacher, in my estimation, they are counting as a teacher. Um, and so that teacher working on a small with a small group of kids, one to five, one to six, in some cases for Jason, it may even be one to one, that really skews the data um, for schools like us. So I have no desire to go to the EPS funding minimum level and you know, I think that it's, I've worked in schools before where you have one world language teacher for 600 kids and your student gets world language for one quarter every two years. Um, so that is kind of, that's the different education that we can offer kids, um, but it does require communities to kind of go above that EPS model to do that. So that's the quick shot on that. Um, really quickly, I am going to just kind of give you a quick update. I'm going to kind of shift gears out of the EDU 279, a quick update in case this would be of interest to you. Um, currently, we have our remote kids. So I thought I would share with you the remote versus the in-person or hybrid students and how many we have in each of those areas. Um, so currently for our remote fifth grade, we have 27 students and we have one and a quarter teachers for that to meet their need. Um, in sixth grade, we have 19 students with the equivalent of one teacher. 
Um, in seventh grade, we have 19 with one teacher and in eighth grade, we have 17. So we have a total of 82 students right now that have chosen the full remote option. And we are able to service those with 4.4 4 and a quarter teachers, 4.25. Um, now that would work out to about 18.8 for what we would, what in our language, what we're talking about for a class size. Um, and then the in-person, just to kind of give us an idea of how this all broke down this year, the in-person, our fifth grade, we have 76 students in person. For what I'm calling in person is on a hybrid schedule. Um, and that they are, they have four teachers. In sixth grade, we have 106 students and they have five teachers. In seventh grade, 100 students, and they have six teachers. And in eighth grade, 103 students with six teachers for a grand total of 385 um, being serviced by 21 teachers. So again, it's pretty, pretty weird, but of an average class size of 18.3. So very similar numbers for that. Now, what that does not take into account is our remote allied arts teachers. They're all working remotely. And again, that kind of goes into what Jeff was saying. If all teachers were teaching every period and all students were in a block every period, that would change that. It would be much more of a student teacher ratio versus class size. Um, and it does not take into account our world language teachers. Um, they are also in, in here. These are really just their classroom teachers and their core content subjects. So that um, is our current state of, of where we are and, and, how, and how that's all working out. Are there any other qu uh, questions? I was looking over my notes for anything else. I, I think I wanted to touch on the EDU 279. I do want to spend some more time with it. I know two years ago, um, what prompted Jeff's charts really was a confusion around trying to dig deep into figuring out how teachers were assigned where. And I know it's through the NEO system and, you know, we enter teachers and positions and, and through Jeff's deep digging, he caught me with a couple of middle school teachers being assigned to Jeff, if I remember correctly in that process. So um, I would look forward to starting to go a little deeper into that um, just to make sure that what's being compared is, is really apples to apples. So, but there is definitely a challenge in the formula setup of when they include one through five, that throws us, it just makes us dig a little deeper to get to the bottom of who they're counting for what. But um, yeah, so if you have any questions, I would do my best to answer them for you. Any questions for Troy? All right, not at this time. We probably, we may at the end when we, did it, Cindy, did you have something? I, I was just going to ask Troy if the data that you shared is available in any of our handouts or can um, it be? No, it is not, Cindy, because it's on the back of an envelope that I'm looking <laughs> at right now that I has already been mailed once. So, but I'll put it into a format. Uh, I'll, I'll just quickly do that and send it to you all. Yeah, just, I mean, nothing fancy. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, you have the data that I, that I provided last time regarding the next year's, you know, class size mm -hmm. and, and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So I'll just add the remote and the in-person and you already have the EDU 279. It's all included on that one yeah. sheet. So I can okay. do that. Thank you. Great. Any other questions for Trey? Okay. We may have some more at the end. Um, Jason. Sure. sure. Good evening, everyone. I was trying to figure out, is that Troy's dog or Heather's dog? Okay, barking. Okay, <laughs> it's Troy's, and then mine started going wild because he heard Troy's. Okay. He was sound asleep, yeah. and now it's barking. I'm gonna blame it on you. Very I'll cute. Uh, so, thank you, folks, for um, the opportunity to kind of share tonight. I think what I figured I would do tonight, knowing that um, Troy and Jeff were going to talk a little bit about um, the EPS uh, formula, I was going to keep it quite simple and just kind of review. Um, what's going on at Pond Cove right now um, in, in kind of some specific detail um, regarding our, our staffing and enrollment. And I'm really only talking tonight about um, staffing um, as it relates to um, classroom teachers. Um, and so of course, as, as they mentioned, as Troy and Jeff mentioned with the EPS formula, 
um, you know, we count our classroom teachers and we have uh, class sizes, but the actual student teacher ratio is determined by all of the teachers in the building with the teachers with teacher certification. So, um, you know, I'm not going to refer tonight to our tech integrators or, or um, intervention specialists or world language teachers. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm hoping that I, I thought it would be nice to do just a little bit of a review of, um, of what's going on at Pond Cove. We have just really truly exceptional instruction happening every day uh, and, and I just really whole, wholeheartedly mean that the 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 learning curve um, that has taken place in, in folks that started off um, being new to remote instruction and hybrid instruction and um, these folks are the experts now right we've we've seen the experts develop right before our eyes in the past year all over the country and i'm just i couldn't be more proud of our teachers and our support staff and our kids uh, so right now as you folks know our enrollment overall enrollment is down and i i explained this earlier this year that um Right now we have a, a 497 students, uh, but we have 30 to 35 plus that we expect to come back that are homeschooling or went to private schools and said in letters and emails to me, we can't wait to come back, but we're gonna make this choice for our family now. Um, so, you know, we expect 527 to 532 next year for our enrollment to be back up where it's been for the past few years. So out of those 597 students, right, we currently still have 73 fully remote students as of as of today with the data I looked at. Uh, so, um, and I'm just going to kind of quickly go through and perhaps if anyone has questions, jot them down. I'd love to answer any questions for you at the end, and this will be brief. Um, so out of the 597, we have 96 kindergarten students. And so we serve those students with five teachers teaching the hybrid model um, and one fully remote teacher. And so um, we that fully remote teacher, that class started very large at the very beginning. We had 22 students and very early on as families were, we were adjusting and families were adjusting. That fully remote class now has 12 students in it and um, all the rest of the students are in the hybrid program. And we have 94 grade one students and we're servicing those students through five hybrid classes. Um, we also have one fully remote grade one class with 16 students. And then we have three grade one students in a multi-age grade one, two class. So there's all sorts of, we, we thought really creatively and um, made things work for students and um, so we're servicing them in so many different ways. We have 110 grade two students this year, and we have five hybrid teachers um, servicing those students and one fully remote teacher with 14 students in her class. Um, we have, so for third grade, we have 88 students in third grade this year. We had a lot of third graders that homeschooled or went or temporarily left and plan to come back. So our third grade class is pretty small. We have 88 students, four hybrid teachers, and one a fully remote teacher with 14 students. And then we also have uh, four other students in a multi-age grades three, four. Um, and we have been, as I mentioned, we also have the multi-age grade one, two. And those multi-age classes were um, intimidating and scary. You know, you ask, you ask an educator to um, teach remotely. And by the way, could you please teach a multi-age class as well? They have just done so well with it. Um, I, I'm, I'm just amazed. And finally, we have 109 grade four students right now. We have five hybrid teachers um, servicing those students. And we have um, 10 fully remote grade four students. And they are in a multi-age grade three, four. Um, so that's just kind of, you know, an overview of um, just how, you know, our enrollment's down to slightly below 500. We fully expect that folks are, are coming back as they said to be up in the 500, over 500. And um, we have just so many different options for servicing students with the hybrid, the remote and the multi-age classes. 
Uh, you have, I'm wondering if you have any questions for me um, regarding enrollment at all or staffing. Any questions from the board? I don't think so. We don't have a lot of questions at this point in the evening yet. Yeah. Okay. That should change. I think that should change. We usually get. Thank you so much. Could, yeah. could, could I ask a question? I'm sorry. I couldn't find my hand raising function. Of course. Function. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, Jason, um, are you seeing the, I think you uh, mentioned in a recent meeting that the kindergarten um, registration is uh, fairly robust this year. Um, so you're seeing the, the current kinder or the incoming kindergarten class um, perhaps more on schedule with how it has been previously or hard yeah, to say. Yeah, so seven, 74 official registrations so far and it's quite early. Um, and so um, Barb has been, I think this might, Barb has been doing this for maybe 30 something years. And so she has little cards of, of throughout the years at what time of year, um, you know, how many students were registered by what month. And so we're, we're ahead. Um, uh, and we, she has kind of feelers out and has like almost 90 names that she definitely expects. And then we've got 74 official registrations. And we always, usually we kind of go over a hundred and then we have conversations and some parents decide to maybe do preschool another year and we end up around a hundred high nineties. So I think we're right on track for a typical um, kindergarten registration year. Um, and we're planning, we're st already starting plans for screening and orientations and things like that. And so just then thinking ahead to staffing, it sounds like probably six teachers is what you're looking at for the kindergarten. As, as of right now, yes, yes, six teachers. I, we, I believe that six teachers would um, basically, you know, and things could change, but I believe six teachers would allow us to staff the, the kindergarten. And um, if enrollment doesn't go too high, allow us to, um, you know, follow uh, safety guidelines and reopen at three feet learning in the fall. Um, pretty, pretty confident about that. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions about enrollment and staffing discuss discussions? Okay. Well, let's move on to the fund balance discussion. This is a discussion that we started last time. And uh, to remind you, um, I'm going to lean on Marcy here a bit, I think, but to remind you, um, Marcy's included again in a packet, but there are a couple different options for us um, on how we may want to use our fund balance to a couple different things. Um, uh, uh, make a dent or, or fully fund a, the school nutrition um, deficit that we have um, and um, or the uh, property tax uh, uh, impact. So there's a couple different sort of levers there. That's in your packet. It's a six page document. So if you want to refer to that, that's what we'll start discussing. And sorry, I'm just pulling mine up. And Mar Marcy, maybe maybe just for the benefit of some people who are here, what, would you mind just quickly going through a couple options again? And that may kick off our discussion. That sounds great, Phil. I'll um, just pull up this. We. We last time talked about um, the different scenarios and the use of fund balance and the goal of the board to maintain a recommended fund balance of 2% maybe hovering around between 1.5 and 2.2% down here in this little category here. I'll do that so you can see it better. Um, and so when we started this process, we were at a point where we had full of all of the requested budgets and the concept design in there and the school nutrition deficit, if you can see that number right here, the 292. And at that time, we had a recommendation of $600,000 for fund balance use. Um, since that time, uh, we, we had a couple of scenarios that we discussed, right? Um, and I did a slide, I'll skip to seven here because I did slide seven for you guys for tonight. And um, I apologize because this news came in 
um, later than when the packets went out, but I wanted to make sure you had this scenario in your uh, arsenal of data here to think about everything. Um, a recommendation was to use a little bit more fund balance. So I increased the fund balance here to 740,000. Um, this, this scenario right here shows your unassigned fund balance that we're starting with for the 1.1. And um, as Phil had mentioned, that's kind of what we were talking about our very, for our very first budget meeting was a starting point of the fund balance for this year is the audited amount of 1.1. If we use the 740,000, it takes our balance down to this 401, which by the way, still is hovering close to 2% around, I think it's 1.33%. So it's still, this is an acceptable amount. It's not too low where the auditor would, um, would say we're, that's just a little too low for us to go. And if in this scenario, it, it reflects the reduction in the health insurance. And it also, this is just for you to see for information again, but it reduces the concept design financing in place of um, having to have the full amount in there for expenses. This is the rate at this point where that changes everything. So it's, it drops to the 5.43% for the expenditure increase and the 4.11 for the property tax. So again, Phil, um, this is just a summary if, um, if you use the 740,000 for fund balance and all of these up here are, are at that situation. And this does doesn't, that, does this, does this 740 um, doesn't anticipate anything specific like a school nutrition deficit or it's just moving it in? That's going to be my question. Does it address any yeah. of the school deficit? Yes. Yes, it does. So this scenario keeps the full amount. Um, let me go back to just show you what that amount is for the, the see this amount here, this 292.509. That has, that scenario I just showed you in slide seven keeps that in there. So uh, let me go back to slide seven. I'll, I'll explain this a little bit slower for you too. This slide shows the requested budgets that include the, you would be able to cover your school nutrition deficit in the total amount of the 292,000. This, this slide shows requested budgets intact as presented from original requests. Um, and this shows being able to remove the amount for the concept design and shifting to a financing option. So sorry, I, I, I probably went too quickly on that one. Um, does that help clarify where this scenario shows where we are right now? And this That's is for just me, if you... Yeah. Go ahead, Marcy. No, go sorry. Ahead. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, it does for me. Yeah. So, so uh, I know you threw it together last uh, today, but so we would have another line under there that would just say this includes school nutrition deficit of 292.509. Yes. Right. Yes. That, yes. Correct. I think I, yeah. I just went so quickly this afternoon on this. I, yeah. I left that out, but it would, instead of saying requested budgets, I would, um, for further uh, use for the public to have on your website, I think that I would really want to add that to make that clear since that's definitely not clear. I would add this includes the school nutrition deficit, this includes the new position requests, um, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And the new and the new positions, just for people who are listening and heard, include they're all in the packet, but they include certain interventionist uh, positions yeah. that are added in response to what we expect to uh, expect to need based out of uh, the, the the hybrid learning this year, I guess the best way to put it. Um, Correct. So Elizabeth, I, you were kind of jumping in there. Did you have another question about about this? Oh, uh, Marcy covered it and I, I just find this one pretty interesting because looking back historically last year we landed at a 3.79 percent property mm -hmm. tax increase um, and that's after our um, our taxes get the, from the school side get run through this machine that it seems like only John Q knows how to explain maybe <laughs> about you know uh, valuation and all these other things and when we say 4.11, it'll mm -hmm. turn out to be some completely different lower number that is- that, that is that is right, Elizabeth. You know what yes. I'm talking about, Marcy? Yes, thank you. 
the bottom line, you're right, it, get, it gets absorbed into the bottom line of their uh, pro forma tax rate. And before you know it, what we have projected at a 4.11, you're right, Elizabeth, it ends up being lower because it goes, it gets absorbed into their bottom line, ta into the bottom line tax rate for the total town. Right. That was just um, looking at 4.11 and looking back to last year at 3.79, I imagine after it gets run through that mm -hmm. pro forma, we might be in a very similar position. Correct. That is right. And Donna, can you clarify again, um, that increase in expenditures, how much of that is staff salaries and benefits that increase as a result of the union? So um, that the increase would be a 4.6% with just um, the same number of people as this year moving forward up to next year with the increase in salary and benefits. Actually, is that true now, Marcy, with our difference in benefits? Oh yeah, that's, um, that's a really good point, Donna. I think it, would be, it would be a bit less than that because it, of the change, the recent change mm -hmm. in benefits today. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> okay. But it would probably, I would imagine it'd be close to around 4%. Yes, it would still hover around that, that amount. And again, those are sort of fixed increases that are through contractual. Correct. Uh, contractual increases, right. Okay. I mean, I, I find this, I'll, I guess I'll jump in here. I, I want the board to weigh in. I find this to be an intriguing scenario and use of our fund balance. Um, it, it, it has a contingency, right? Which is that we would, we would need to work with the town council on the ban, the, um, Fund anticipation note, or the or the finding, or or a similar financing mechanism mm -hmm. for the concept design, um, and so and we started that conversation this morning. That would have to continue, but if that's if if that's something that um, the town council and the board gets behind, I think this is a pretty good option. And the any other sort of reactions to this from the board? And I can't see you, so just feel free to jump in. I like this, I like it up on the screen. Well, I kind of like it up on the screen for a moment, just because uh, it gets something people to look at. Yeah. There, okay. Okay. Yeah, Heather. Um, I'm just wondering. Um, I like I like the sound of this as well. I think it um, it covers all of our bases. <laughs> in fact, it feels like a magical answer that we've been waiting for to come through, which is amazing. Um, but I'm curious to know, is there a downside that you can see, Marcy? Is there something that I'm not noticing? Um, it seems like the end um, percentage is within that hovering around uh, 2% and the auditor, and, and that wouldn't be upset. And it feels like that's what that money is there for, to help out. Mm -hmm. um, and this will help um, relieve the taxpayer portion, um, lower the money, as well as cover the nutrition that we've been concerned about, as well as cover these few positions that we thought were going to be um, part of the COVID money that Donna was referring to earlier in the night that looks like we're not getting that $2 million to pay for that. So in my, in my opinion, it feels like a win-win, and I'm kind of looking for like, where's the catch? What's, what's the downside? Do you see any downside to it? Or are we just really fortunate that we had a large enough unassigned fund balance to help us out? That's, that's exactly right, Heather. I just okay. feel like we were, were extremely lucky in this particular year when we really needed to address the large nutrition, nutrition deficit and be able to get, get that behind us. We really, and the fact that we're not receiving the COVID money um, in this next round, as we had expected, I just feel like we're extremely lucky, um, knock on wood. And so I think that with the continued hard work that, that everyone puts in, I, I feel like it's a, it continues to be a win-win. And I think that also with the current economic condition and the interest rates, again, I, it, it's not really a downside at all with being able to finance compared to other years where the interest rates were much higher. It, yeah. It's a much yeah. Um, well, thanks. I um, I agree. I think it's a win-win. I don't think that we're extremely lucky. I think we have people like you and Donna working really hard to find things and be creative and, um, for example, come up with the ban, um, which is a fabulous idea. So yeah, I would be supporting this use 
of the funds um, in scenario seven. I, I, I think it looks good to me because so I, I don't- have, I have a little wrench to throw in this. I'm sorry. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> Oh, and that's right. I forgot. We have a little bit of a little bit <laughs> of a wrench. Um, and this came from um, Elizabeth forwarded some questions that she had. And one of the questions that we have to be thinking about is um, because of the goal of bringing um, all students back into the classroom, we have to think about what that would mean to our district. And so I had Jason and um, we talked about it at 18 this morning and um, Jeff feels like the high school will be okay without needing any extra facilities. Um, but I, I'm gonna ask Jason and Troy to just talk a little bit about your thoughts about next year and what you would need as far as staffing and portables because we did talk about that today. So um, Troy, why don't you Don't be mad at me, Heather. <laughs> the bearer of bad news um so for us um returning the potential to return to school in the fall um depends on a couple of things so it's still you know anticipating a three-foot distancing for students and it's anticipating the um, indoor gathering size to not you know, return to 50. So with those things happening, um, we feel like we could return all kids to school in the fall. The problem is we, there are some spaces that we all know are within our schools that we've created that were not typical classroom size spaces. So for example, our computer science class that students have as an allied arts that room can hold maybe 16 kids, maybe 18 at three feet apart, um, that needs to be able to hold 24. Now, if we had to go, if we were to go try to go back this spring, we may be able to manage that if our, because we have some classrooms that are open for due to their teaching remotely. Um, so that's why some things may be able to happen like this spring, but would be different in the fall. So in the fall to do that, we would need we anticipate three portable classes, three portables for a total of six classroom spaces, um, two of which would have to be reserved for phys, phys ed because phys ed will no longer be able to take place in the gym under that scenario because it will be used for the cafeteria. And on rainy days, cold days, gym is still gonna need to take place as part of the schedule, as part of the routine. They'll need a place to be to do that and that can house their, that size class. So that would have to occur. No additional staffing for that because we already have the teachers for it. Um, then we would also need um, an additional space for lunch for the potential overflow of the lunch rooms with the entire student body back. So one of those spaces would have to be for that. Um, and then we have a couple of courses. For example, our interventionist currently We'll be teaching courses right now. I don't know how familiar you are with the school, but Jay Kogovic works out of the Madden room. So it's a small room in the back of the library that was meant for an office. Um, so for those reasons, um, we would need six spaces if we bring everybody back in the fall with a three foot distancing. Um, and it's tricky, three portables equal six spaces, um, just to be clear with that. So. And then we feel like we could do that with no additional staffing at that point. It's really more a space issue um, for us to, to pull that all off. So one portable we're figuring with setup costs would be approximately $70,000 for one. So. And would that include the furniture or is, would furniture also, you need furniture in addition to that? Correct. Good point. We would need furniture in addition to that. Portables yeah, we come, also need heat, uh, like heat and water and electricity. Um, in, my, in my experience, portables quite often have no water. Um, they go inside if they need to use the bathroom or to get a drink or they bring a drink with them in my experience in the past. Um, but they definitely need heat and obviously power and they need to be furnished. Um, so we are- Place them somewhere. And they have to be placed somewhere. Yep. 
on school property. Yes. Could could I ask Donna? You said seventy thousand for the setup cost. No, the seventy thousand for the portable, and that would include the setup cost. And that would include the setup cost. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, clarification. And um, Troy, you um, this would include all remote students returning to um, to school as well. It would be all and, students, all staff. Excellent. Thank you so much. And so then, Jason, do you want to talk about your scenarios? Sure. So. I'll kind of briefly share. I, I have two different scenarios. Um, and I think I can, I'll really kind of talk about one and then talk about kind of some of the risk factors that might, um, might um, create the need for more space and more staff. So again, my first scenario is is um, I think I'm very hopeful, but it's, ve it's very tight. And it's likely that um, our class sizes would be larger than this. But I was able to work out a scenario that potentially could work. And again, this is very, very preliminary. Um, given projected enrollment um, to have 100% of student, the assumption is 100% of students back, 100% of uh, teaching staff back. So again, if, um, some teaching staff uh, were needed to um, continue with fully remote teaching, then that would affect this. Um, you know, I'm relying on having those folks coming back and teaching in the building with this scenario. So we would have, in this scenario, we would add, need to add one new teacher. And again, it's very tight. So we would have, um, if no other students, which is unlikely, registered, uh, you know, if not a lot of other students registered over the summer, um, we would have 114 um, third grade students. And that would be 22 to 23 in a class. But with three foot distancing, um, we're looking at fitting 20 at best 21. And that's even kind of tight in a class. Um, so we would be looking at either relocating that class if it was possible to find a bigger suitable space and then that would bump someone else. So we're looking at, to me, best case scenario would be adding a teacher and um, strongly considering adding a portable because that teacher would take up a space which would bump an interventionist or some sort of specialist or um, and then also we will have the same issue, which, you know, I've been thinking about portable, uh, we to eat at six foot distancing, as long as we can still have gathering large gatherings at 75% capacity or more, um, we would be using our gymnasium as an overflow cafeteria. And so phys ed would be displaced and we need to continue phys ed A, for our students' health and well-being, B for our schedule, teacher planning time. So it, we would be looking at um, potentially a portable. Not sure if they can be configured to be a large space, or if the the load bearing wall needs to be in the middle. And I don't know if you could have a larger space and kind of actually space kids out and move around a little bit in a in a modular. Um, or if it would need to be two small classroom size rooms. But so what we're looking at, a, we're looking at staffing and a portable. Um, so I would say with that scenario, one portable, one teacher. Now, just looking at historical data of how many students register, you know, after we make these projections over the summer, throughout the school year, some of the numbers are a little bit tight that we would want to consider and and I can share more details with you as time goes on, as we really get more deeper into the planning that we may need to add an additional teacher or more in an additional modular. But um, that depends on how many kids move in. And I think we'd be pretty safe with the one teacher, two teachers max, depending on if kids move in, but I think we'd need at least one in another space. So that's kind of where I'll stop for now. I'm glad to answer any questions. I'd answer the best that I could. Um, 
Thank you. Well, I could look and, back um, at the papers, but the estimated cost yeah. for the one portable and the one teacher, because we're at around 70,000 for Troy. So what would that be, Jason? I so think it would be. Yeah, it's about yeah. 70,000 for portable. And I'm looking at Marcy's notes and she, she yeah. said, it's the total with water, sewer, and electricity. So they are it is, included, okay. included in there. Mm -hmm. um, I think Laura is asking for the total, and I spent most of my time listening to Jason and doing math. And if I mean, <laughs> I'm ballparking, and Donna, you correct me, but I ballpark yeah, yeah, about eighty for a teacher and seventy for the portable. Correct. So I got one fifty for Pond Cove, and I got two ten for the middle school, which puts us at three sixty. Okay. Mm -hmm. in uh in contingency or in um hope for 200 of covid funds um i think we have some do we have any uh guesstimates on furniture and furniture costs i i know um it sounds like maybe tables aren't gonna work and we're gonna need to order some desks and then perhaps also furnish the trailers any and maybe too soon to have ideas on that uh, we, we haven't figured the total furniture costs um tomorrow um, several members of the community are coming to help move the desks out of storage, so we'll have a better idea. I think Jeff seems to be all set with furniture at the high school. Um, he's, he's threatened Jason and Troy with, don't touch my desks that are in storage. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think they're all set. Um, but um, it, we'll, see, we'll see what we have in storage um, tomorrow. But we might have extra furniture, right? Because it's like we can't fit all the kids in the one class, so we have the extra desks for those, and then well, we have a lot no of tables. Crossover. We have a lot of tables. That's we don't the have problem. desks, yeah. and tables will not do it for the three feet foot social distancing for the class. We don't have the desks from the elementary school to help uh, some to help some furnish the portable. We have some. But um, we're probably going to need more desks for even in the um, in the school classrooms, just because we had so many tables um, that we okay. just really can't use. So I understand. Yeah. And we are and we are looking and working on a plan when we start to refurnish these rooms. Is how can we utilize maybe two two tables per room? In, in, and still kind of so to use up what we have for furniture. I mean, it's very frustrating. You go in a science lab, the tables happen to be five feet long. So to try to set two kids not across from each other, not facing each other, you know, three feet apart on a five foot table, it's, it's just not, you know, maybe kitty corner, like that's stretching, stretching it. So there's a lot of, a lot of equipment there that is really good equipment we never want to get rid of. But right now it's, it's kind of causing a problem. Yeah, Jeff Shed. Uh, you're on mute. Just to be clear, why I I think we'll be okay in the high school, and I want to make clear what the assumption is that I'm making about behind that, um, and that is that we would do what a, uh, a number of other we we have sort of done a little bit. We've headed in this direction, but we haven't been as Basically, what we would have to do is we would have to run an open campus <clears throat> um, so that students would be here when they have classes. They would have the opportunity to go to lunch, probably not for ninth grade, uh, but probably for 10th, 11th, and 12th. Um, and that's the way high schools have been able to get around. Um, somewhat the issue of not having to provide eating space for every single student. Um, so that's that's that is the assumption that I'm making, and I just wanted to put it out there because it's something the board would have to chew on. If that's not acceptable, then then there, then we would need to think about some additional furniture at least. And I'd love to avoid a portable, but um, the the issue is basically lunch. Um, but I think if, if, if open campus is acceptable, which is what quite, a, we have gone in that direction. We have a more open campus now than we ever have uh, because of limitations in space. And I would anticipate that we would make it even more open for more students. Uh, I just have a quick couple. Uh, first, just, just to make sure the members of the community talk that, that are here, we're talking just to make it completely clear about next year's budget. So when we're talking about going back and things like that, that's what we're talking about. There's a separate work going on about this spring. 
So I just don't want that to be confused. This is about next year. We're planning for the budget for next year. So that's why we're having this conversation. Um, and, it, and it anticipates 100% return, whereas the spring would not necessarily because we have remote people who have chosen, kids have chosen remote. So I just want to make that clear so there's no confusion there. Um, the COVID money, obviously, if we got what we thought we were going to get, we, we would have just planned to use that. Here right. we're talking, um, you know, best case scenario. I guess I know these are and these are early numbers, 360. Uh, uh, expenditures, maybe 200 in COVID money. So uh, is there anything else that you are anticipating? You know, we know we had a general conversation this morning. Um, it's, it's based on Title I funding, um, and on, which is unfortunate from my perspective. And I just put that on the record because- Well, uh, we think, you know, we think it. We yeah, think we think it. I think it does, you know, I, I think it does too, um, but because obviously this affects everybody, but um, I'm wondering if there's any other opportunities as the state looks at this, the state of Maine itself is getting a big chunk of money that there's some discretion. If there's any thinking at the state level, obviously you may not know the answer yet, but where we could potentially tap into some of those resources, um, even outside of what we're gonna directly get. No. I haven't. Okay. I haven't heard anything. Marcy was just um, at a meeting on Thursday and she heard nothing. <laughs> okay. But we'll consistently, uh, Don and I each week have our meetings filled um, with the state and superintendents and we'll definitely keep our eyes and ears open for everything that might be coming our way for sure. And I expect, I don't think they've told you yet, but I expect in the next week or couple of weeks they would have to start giving some guidance on how the money's going to start flowing because I suspect it's just going to start flowing this short while. Um, so we'll have some more information on that. Yeah. I assume. Okay. Hopefully we'll know something before April 6th, but um, yeah, that's what right. we're hoping. Right. I hope so too. Yeah. Elizabeth. So kind of swinging back around to the very attractive slide seven. <laughs> I like that, Elizabeth. I love that, Elizabeth. <laughs> it was very attractive. And I don't think that we have to abandon it. I, I kind of have a yeah. question around if, let's say, we took um, half of that deficit and we only paid off half this year. Right. And so that would be around 146000 mm -hmm. We could then, and I'm just, I'm just throwing this out for conversation. Mm -hmm. We could put 146,000 into contingency, mm -hmm. which means that it's not earmarked towards anything in the budget, which I think means that, you know, mm -hmm. if, if we get more funding from relief money, then we haven't gone afoul of all those restrictions. But just if, if I think we're getting $200,000, we put 146 into contingency, we already have 100. So we bring our total up to 246. Yep. Then we get please at least 200,000. It looks like we might be able to cover those costs mm -hmm. if we kind of go at it that way. Yeah, that's, that's And we still get that attractive bottom line of slide seven yeah. and yeah. a lot of the, the things that we actually really, really need for the school department mm -hmm. and kind of have that, we've got our bets head, we need to hedge our bets for the, the fall. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to plan for the three foot distancing and then hope that they go away, but we can't, just go in with hope and no plan. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. No, I agree. I think that's. So I just suggest like that for the plan, board. Yeah. yeah. Any any reaction to that, Laura? I would say 100% agree with um, Elizabeth's logic there. I think it sounds really good and sound. And I totally agree with. Yes, we could just hope that the three foot distancing mm -hmm. goes away, but we absolutely need to plan. And so. I appreciate you asking the questions, Elizabeth, when it's like, oh, this looks too good to be true, but there's these very important questions to ask to see. I how sadly rain on parades. That's my job. <laughs> well, <laughs> is school feasible for the children in the fall? That's absolutely right. Yeah. 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 And it's in line with, you know, Marcy, the work that Marcy showed us before, which is that we didn't have to, I mean, I think we, uh, well, what I got out of the last meeting is we wanted to pay down some, some of the school nutrition mm -hmm. deficit. Um, and it, because we, I think we kind of eliminated the don't pay it down option, but, but we still had flexibility there in terms of how much we were going to do over two years, for example. Mm -hmm. So I, li I like it too, um, Elizabeth. Uh, um, yeah, this is not the time to pay down the whole thing now, you know. 
Right. No. I like that. No. That's good. Any other reaction from board members on that? I agree. This is the next. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Cindy. Oh, I agree with Elizabeth and I would even, you know, think through it just to make sure we're not just like, you know, we we had to account for potential furniture expenditures. It, will that be enough? I mean, even paying down half of it, does that leave us with enough contingency given that our COVID funding is kind of a wild card right now too? So maybe not a wild card, but probably a minimum right now. Um, would we, should we consider even a little more to contingency just to make sure we're covered for any incidentals. Like Jason mentioned, if we have unanticipated enrollment, we might need another teacher or we might not, you know, we need to expand that a little bit. So my idea, I just did a little more math. Um, it would leave us with 86,000 for the unanticipated furniture oh. and other stuff. So it's, it's just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's a great idea and going in the right direction. I just want to make sure that we feel like we're covered um, for kind of the what if scenarios too. If, if we have more students than anticipated or we don't get as much COVID funding as we're anticipating even at the lower level. Mm -hmm. Right. Or see, when, do, when would we have to pay that nutrition money? I mean, could we plan on paying half and then Yep. really pay a third yep. if, we, if we get stuck. Yep, exactly. Um, I manage internally the on the accounting side, the transfer for the payment into the fund. And so that also means that if by the end of the year we had received money or something happened and we had that contingency amount, I can go back to you as a board and get a vote to be able to uh, transfer it into the nutrition fund instead of, so it would just require me coming back to you and the superintendent and the board to get approval to do that. But we could, that's a possibility for you as well. And we could give less as well. So and that less, and, and less. that's right. Okay. Yes, thank you. And yes, and, I, and also I just wanted to make sure, um, I, I'm sorry, I didn't want to indicate that I was limiting by slide seven as well too. So you, you're, feel free to, you know, increase that um so we could kind of set a goal of half and then see where things right. land mm -hmm. right right yeah. yeah because we control the timing on um, from the accounting standpoint of that anyone else jen or kimberly or heather for that matter yeah i think um i think especially hearing um that added bit of information um from marcy i think half makes sense um yeah i'm in favor of that okay as in Jen? i'm i'm in favor as well heather's nodding i think what i'd like to you know what i was hoping at a minimum to get out of tonight was was direction for the administrators on the amount of fund balance. Um, and I, I, I'm kind of hearing that we're getting comfortable with the amount that was in slide seven being used. And generally the way we've broken it out as described by a combination of Mar Marcy and Elizabeth, we could we could potentially move those levers, but, but I think it's important at this point in our process to at least kind of and on, on the amount of fund balance that we would like to draw down on. And just to be clear, that we're talking about um, 700,000, right, Marcy? Um, well, Phil, I think 740,000, if that's okay. 740, okay. Yeah, if that's okay. Oh, that's right. We don't have slide seven on my screen. That's right. I was looking sorry, at the, sorry about I was that. Looking at the, yeah, yeah. Marcy, yeah. can you put that up again so people can look at it one more time? Yes, that's a good idea. Yeah. There I we think go. it's also useful to kind of talk about if we're if we are comfortable setting that goal for paying half of the nutrition deficit that the other half of those funds would go into contingency. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what I'll do is make sure that um, first of all, uh, I'll update this slide to indicate those situations. But also, um, Elizabeth, I mentioned to you, I'm really wanting to do an infographic summarizing all of this for you. So that will be part of it. I think that would be really important for you guys to be able to have, to outline these key components in a, in a clear graphic and that you have it for yourself and for the public. 
That's my goal. That's what I'm I agree. On. Yeah. And before I do that, I'll make sure that I run this by you and Donna to make sure that I have it um, recorded correctly and the numbers in there. And, okay. uh, and I'll be working this week on updating all of the position control numbers for the health insurance benefits as well. So I'll have that finalized, these numbers that you're talking about as well. And, and there's also the chance that our actual increase in health insurance percentage of increase will be lower than the 4.2. So we can all mm -hmm. fingers crossed for that. Yes. Do you want me to keep sharing, Phil? On the screen? One moment. Yeah, just any other questions from the board? I, I think from getting the sense, we obviously don't vote in these meetings, but the sense of the board in terms of how we want to continue with this budgeting process. I think we, it sounds to me, we've heard from everyone and we're comfortable with this. Marcy. Okay. All right. That sounds. And by the next meeting, and we'll talk about the next meeting in a second. And like you said, we'll have a little more, we'll have this in a, in a format to look at. Right. Um, right. The public uh, ho hopefully have a little bit more precision on the health insurance mm -hmm. and on the um, estimate of expenditures for full-time return. We've got sort of back of envelopes now, but it'd be nice to have that a little more refined. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for next time, next time, are we going to have to do a straw poll? Is that our last budget workshop before we send it to a business meeting? I believe that's right. Um, we only have, we have one left. And so that's one thing I just wanted to chat with everybody about is um, uh, before this, before this presentation, quite frankly, the, the, uh, that Marcy and Donna gave us, I was thinking we might need one more. I'm not, I don't know if we do or not now. I mean, this is getting down, I think, to where we mm -hmm. kind of, where we were aiming for, um, you know, for the increase in expenditures and property tax rate percentage. What, what, what do people feel like? Do you think you're gonna need, we have one more schedule. Um, so we're gonna get some for, more before we get to our regular board meeting where we vote on the budget. Um, that's on April 6th. What do you think, Elizabeth? I'm going to lean on you as my the past. <laughs> I think that we, we, um, we've got a lot of good information tonight. And I think we've distilled yeah. down pretty close to where we want to land. So with our, yeah, I think that one more workshop, we'd be able to take our straw poll is my okay. feeling, but. Well, that's what I'm feeling too. I think, you know, I'm pretty happy about the fact that this, that this funds all the positions that we think we need to respond to the situation we're in today. And, and to keep the high level of the schools we have today. Um, and, um, and we'll get a bit more information for the next meeting, but also budgets for full-time return and pays down some debt. So I'm feeling pretty good about it. There, there is the one remaining. And I think in the interim, um, I'd also like to maybe continue the conversation and Marcy uh, and Donna side on this um, ban or sort of the, you know, the ability to finance the concept design. I want to make sure we're, you know, that that's going to be a real an option for us because obviously that would change the circumstances. Um, Phil, I just wanted to add. I have yeah. a full meeting with the bond council on Friday, April second. So, if um, and I think that I would Great. be able to secure our next steps by that meeting to be able to report to you on April sixth, and that Great. way they know that there's a, a serious consideration on the board's side. To and I would I would have those next steps ready for us. Great. Perfect. And also keep the lines of communication open with the finance chair and chair mm -hmm. of town yes. council. I think I saw yes. Mr. Yes. Gabrielson here tonight. Yes, yes. And uh, John Q is involved in the April 2nd meeting. And uh, probably if I'll reach out to the town side too for that particular meeting as well. Great. Well, thank you. This is great work. Um, I'm feeling good about where we are. I had one more thing. So before we move on um, from this, and maybe maybe you can take this down now, Marcy. Oh yes, so, sorry, Phil. <laughs> I want to make sure there are no other questions about any of the things we've talked about. I just have a brief update on a budgeting issue for next year that I promised the town council I'd bring up tonight. Oh, right. Okay. Well, here just very briefly. Um, we had a discussion in our in our monthly meeting this morning about um, the one town concept. And actually, I'm just going to give a brief. I'm going to give the high level, 
and then I might turn it over to, to Marcy or Donna. Um, but as you all know, we have the one town concept in this town, which I think really everyone agrees works to the benefit of the taxpayers in the long run. And what I heard this morning is I think it saves us about $2 million overall in tax in taxing, um, where there's been a discussion among the business managers and, and the town manager and the superintendent is about is about how that is how we're refunded a portion of that or how those expenditures break down across the town side and the school side. And there's been some question, and this shows up um, if you're looking at the at the sheet that we call, you know, the overall uh, expenditure sheet. It shows up on at the very top under expenditures called town reimbursements, and you'll see that's where the money flows in from the town side into our revenue side. So for cleaning services, technology services, and HR assistance. Um, and what, uh, and I may not do this justice, but what our town managers propose is that, is that we start just showing on our own, but on our own budget sheet, essentially what the true cost is and, and, re, and stop with the transfers. Um, there's been some question um, about whether this number that is transferred to us is the right number or not. And there's been apparently some vigorous conversations about that among, on the staff level um, that I became aware of. So um, it would obviously not impact the taxpayer at all. There'd be a lot from a taxpayer's perspective there, you know, the money is the money. It depends. It doesn't matter where it comes from. It clearly matters, at least on the initial side, where it show where the money shows up um, in terms of as we're putting our budget together, Marcy, I think uh, came up with if we were to then if we were to take out this revenue from the town and just say hey, we're all doing our own thing, it would it would add about a one percent increase in our expenditure level this year. Um, so what we had the conversation about, we, we need a lot more information. First of all, I'd like to know um, what is that real number. We wouldn't want to really just transfer it back if really we there was if that wasn't the fair way of looking at it either. And I think we all got to the point where we agreed to continue the conversation, not do it this year. I was not comfortable. And I think most of us on the school side were not comfortable doing that this year um, without much more information. I'd like, you know, three or four years of how this actually potentially does break down. When and if it happens, obviously there could be a one year hit on our side. Again, to the taxpayer, it's, it's nothing is really changing, but it would, where it shows up. Um, and so there would have to be a lot of education for the community and everyone else to, to talk about how this is an adjustment, essentially an accounting adjustment more than anything. And it's not a real expenditure adjustment, but I do anticipate that would, some eyebrows may be raised, but with, if they don't fully understand what's happening. Um, so this was brought up at sort of the end of the meeting, but we had a, we had a pretty uh, robust conversation about it. Um, and we agreed to continue this, I think we all agreed that we should be reflecting the reality. And so it, let's do that if it makes sense, but we wanna really get a better understanding of what it actually means, what the numbers look like, um, and then how we're gonna actually move forward with it in the future. Mm -hmm. So that would begin next year. I, I'm knocking on with hope. I think, I think we got agreement that that would not happen this budget cycle, but, but, we, but we had sort of a tacit agreement. We would start right away with conversations about it mm -hmm. um, in the summer. Um, on how to more fully make that line equitable um, in, the, in the lines of both sides. And Marcy and Donna, I don't know if you want to add to that. Anyway, well, I don't know if we did that justice. But. Well, right now, um, all of the maintenance as far as the lawns and the fields and all of those things, that is all covered, the plowing, everything. It's all covered by the town. So we, the schools don't pay anything for that. Um, we pay for all the custodial services everywhere, but the town reimburses us for par par part of that, as well as part of the technology the town reimburses us for. But the numbers of for the reimbursement are basically fiction at this point. Um, they started off to be, somebody figured out percentages years ago. And of course that's not the same at this time. So, um, so instead of the town reimbursing us for technology and for custodial services, they wanna stop that reimbursement. So that's where we would not be getting that 
uh, transfer of funds. So what it would look like our budget is going up. In the end to the taxpayer, it, it's, it's a wash because it's one big bucket, but um, anyway. So as, can I ask a clarifying question there, Donna? Essentially, it would be the town would be paying for the facilities and the plowing and the maintenance of fields, continue that, and we would take over mm -hmm. the custodial right. staff. And th so that's how they're trying to divide it as opposed to specifically right. like right. even going even more minute, like, okay, well, we're not gonna, pay, you know, the, the town will pay for the plowing in town hall. I mean, it's not going that specific. It's just dividing by the sense that maintenance it would be town, custodial and technology would be yeah. tool. Thanks for that clarification because at one point when I was involved in this conversation, there was a desire to try to figure out, okay, you know, how many hours are custodians um, spending in the library? How many hours are they spending in the right. pool in town hall and try to separate it out that way? And the problem is that sometimes the custodians will start in the school and then they'll get called over to the library right. and right. they'll have to go to right. town hall. Right. It's just, you, you, it's impossible right. to track. No, and I under, and I, I appreciate Heather clarifying that for me because it sounded like maybe we are going that way. And I was like, oh, this is going to be well, such a mess. Well, we thought about yeah, no, how yeah. to do that, but it right. just, it, we, you can't. Right. And at the <laughs> same so time, I think it really makes sense for the town to continue with the upkeep and maintenance of the fields mm -hmm. because they are considered town fields, not necessarily school fields. So it's, it all makes mm -hmm. sense. It does. Is the, um, how much is the one town, is the relationship documented? I mean, I think before we even start, um, or, or in parallel, I guess, to starting um, defining, you know, who's paying for what and kind of truing that up, we want to make sure we have it, you know, kind of documented and agreed upon that the town pays for this, the school pays for this, um, and, and this is how it works. And so there's, I would think, more of a um, established, a, a documented agreement in place. And I, I, I don't know what it's like now. I know several years ago, there wasn't really a, a written agreement for how that was shared. So I think having that agreement and documentation in place for which services are provided by which entity going forward would be helpful and then um, do the accounting piece following that. But I think you need to document um, what the agreement is before you start uh, adjusting the accounting. Yeah, and that, thank you for saying, yeah, and that was, that's very much sort of motivating part of this um, from what I get from Matt Sturgis. Um, and I don't want to talk about Donna leaving right now, but he actually used the example of now that we're going to have a transition in leadership and um, someone who doesn't have the experience for the last few years of budgeting and things like that, this is a good opportunity to uh, more formally document it and formally uh, discuss what the arrangement is. We don't, I my understanding, really fully have that now. So this is a good opportunity to do that. And so part of the discussions that will happen after this budget goes through is first of all a documentation of what we think the expenditures are so we make sure that you know there is some sort of equity there in terms of how it's working but then a format formalization of that of that concept so very much so and i'm right on the same page with you yeah all right well that was what i only wanted to bring up probably have to dig into it more next year but i i um i promised i would start that conversation so it's not a surprise to anyone going forward um all right i think we got some good guidance here tonight and great work from mercy and donna and the principals to get us where we are today i think um any other closing questions or thoughts all right I want to we'll get out of here a little bit effort thank you phil and thank you administration for your effort on all of this i think everybody wants the kids back in school full time and the creative thinking i think is um really helpful in the planning and forecasting. Thank you, Jen. I piggyback on that. So thankful. I'm th and even thankful that um, I'm a person who likes uh, paper documents and I think Marcy delivers them to my house herself. <laughs> so um, I appreciate this team so much. You all go above and beyond and I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you. Our pleasure, Elizabeth.
Great. Well, thank you all. We're going to get out of here a few minutes early. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. All right. Thank good you. Night.